according to me says this, we are all light workers. We all have it within us. And I believe that we were all born onto this planet to bring light to one another. I wanted to start these conversations as I want you to feel like you have a place where you can come, that you're not alone and maybe hear things in a different way than you've heard them before. I do wanna say this, nothing that I'm saying is revolutionary. It's all stuff that you already know and maybe you've just forgotten. If you remember that you have a purpose, not one single person or being on this earth was born purposeless. So this is a collective awakening that the light is within all of us. We just have to be willing to share it and you have to be willing to accept that you are here to be light. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me and my very special guest. She is one of Broadway's most glorious sopranos. She is a Disney princess and also an Andrew Lloyd Webber heroine. You know her from such shows as The Little Mermaid, Masterclass, Les Mis, Love Never Dies, and of course, The Phantom of the Opera. Please say hello to my friend, Sierra Vargas. Oh, Richie, I'm so happy to see you. You have no idea. That clip, we have to talk. That's from your light lessons, which yes. we'll get into later. But I have okay. to tell everybody, if you need a feel-good day, anybody watching, go to SierraBogus.com. Your website is one of the most calming and one of the most beautiful, positive places to be to oh. and go to. Oh, I love that so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was the intention. So I'm really glad that you're receiving it as such. That's great. Listen, first of all, how are you and where are you? I'm in Colorado right now. I'm in Denver, Colorado, which is where I was born and raised. Um, I lasted three months in New York in my apartment. And I have a real cute apartment in New York, but I just needed to get into nature. So I've been in Colorado for two months now. And it's just been it's been heaven. Um, so that helped. I think everybody needs to do things that are going to help them mentally during this time and physically and just whatever, you know, you know, oh, we I gotta know. Do, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we got to do what, what we know we need to do. And when, and I have a hard time making decisions, actually. I, I, it, it doesn't always come easily to me. But when my gut knows something, my gut knows. And, and it took three months in New York, and I was like, okay, my gut knows I just want to go to Colorado. And we never, as performers, too, we never get a chance to have time off to spend, like, actual quality time with our families. And so I thought, this is that chance. Well, this is our 169th day since the New York theater shut down on March 12th. I mean, what a number when you come to think about it, 169. Where were you, Sierra, when the New York theater shut down? So the I'll say this first. The last show that I saw was Six, the musical. Yeah. Imogen Lloyd Webber and I went yeah. to see it together. And we were each other's last hug before quarantine happened. We, we talk about now I've since hugged my family. But... Um, we were our last hug. We said goodbye. And I got on a plane and went to Mexico to go and have some time with my sister in Mexico, my yeah. little sister in Mexico. So I found out Broadway shut down when I, I think I landed in Cancun. And so I was about to have just this time in my life. I didn't know really what was going on. And then I found out my, my older sister texts me and is like, we've just been told cause she played cello for mean girls. Yeah. And she said, we've just been told to come and get our stuff. And we, and I was like, this is, this is crazy. Like, and, and even so I didn't think it was going to be as bad as it, as it is. I don't think any of us thought that, you know, I know a lot of the casts and stuff then went out and got drinks, you know, it was yeah. like, okay, let's just make the best of this. And in the devastation of what was happening, but, but nobody knew it was going to be like this, you know? So I was in Mexico. <laughs> then when I, then once I landed back just four days later, that's when I really was like, got it. And yeah. we're quarantining. And then I was, I quarantined and New York did it right. You know, we did it right. That was the place that you wanted to be during this pandemic because we really did. And New Yorkers aren't afraid to yell at you on the streets. Like yeah. wear a mask, you know, <laughs> it's like, why aren't you wearing a mask? <laughs> so <laughs> it, it actually was, um, 
Yeah, it's weird though, isn't it? It's like a ghost town too. It's sad. It's so strange to explain to people who are outside of New York City. You know, a lot of people have houses and, you know, they have backyards or a pool or they have their SUV and they have like land to walk on. We in New York City, it's a concrete jungle. You know, right. we all work in, you know, the arts. We all work on Broadway or, you know, theater or something. And it's all shut down. All of New yes. York was shut down for the longest time. So it's so hard to explain to people. They're like, oh, you need to go out and hug someone. I'm like, not here. Not here. Not in no. New York. <laughs> not today. <laughs> you know, were you able to throw structure right back into your life? Or, you know, everyone I spoke to, they were like, well, you know, I slept for the first two weeks because, you know, you're so exhausted from doing eight shows a week, or especially if you're previewing, you know, to open in a show, it's, you know, you're on this train from rehearsals to tech, to previews, to changes. So they were like, I couldn't, they couldn't fathom what was actually happening for like that first month. Yes, I think for people that were in shows, yeah. I can only imagine, I remember doing School of Rock when we had that snowstorm and getting to work and then it's like, no, Broadway's canceled that day, which is the most that we ever know is Broadway's canceled that day, if that ever happens. And I remember being like, oh, I can sleep. I didn't have that experience because I wasn't doing a show at the time. Yeah. So I. I did go immediately into, I need some structure yeah. and I, I, I was very regimented because not a lot changed for me because I was already doing the in-between gigs thing. Yeah. And so a lot of us talk about that too. That's like for us at, at the start as artists, we're like, oh, this is, this is quite normal because we are good at managing our time and still, and my amazing friend, Tyler Peck, the yeah. principal dancer of New York City Ballet, for those that don't know, um, and incre just incredible performer and dancer. She started teaching ballet class for free on her Instagram live every single day. And I was like, great. So I, you know, I don't go to my ballet class in the city anymore. That's, that's shut down. My gyms are shut down. So I started doing all my workouts online and Tyler's class online. And so not a lot changed except I couldn't go outside and I couldn't see my friends. That's when I started to get really, really yeah. there. It took me, I was really good for a week. <laughs> I was in a really good positive <laughs> space. And then um, I, I got really sad. Yeah. And um, and my boyfriend lives in Canada, by the way. So I also can't see him. And those, <laughs> those borders are shut. Yeah. And believe me, I would I would try, but it, they're shut. And I remember calling him, and I'm like, I'm really sad. Yeah. I feel really sad. And it's like, yeah, because this is what's happening. Is the normal starts hitting? That's like, yeah. oh, it's not normal limbo. I, it's not normal in between gigs. There isn't an option for there to be um, an audition for a gig or to for your show to get its theater or anything like that. So yeah, it got tough. It got really tough. Um, I think, yeah, after that first week or week and a half for me, and I just, and you know what I didn't feel like doing was singing. Yeah. Has a, have a lot of people said that? Norm Lewis did. I mean, Norm, mm. you know. No, yeah, Norm and I spoke. Yeah, because, you know, my sister is a nurse and, you know, every night at seven o'clock, I have to go outside and bang my pots and I yell and hoot and I would release this like inner tension. I'd be like, I have that five minute window to like, I felt like I was doing something that was making a difference. Yes, I agree. Yes, I had that same exact thing that that seven o'clock time yeah. became so important for me and nothing could deter me from it. It was like, I knew that I had two things on my schedule that day. Yeah. One, Tyler Peck's ballet class, yeah. and two, at seven o'clock, I'm yelling out my window. And it was, I think, again, that's what I loved about being in New York for that time, because we know how to do it. You know, yeah. New Yorkers know how to do it. And there's this strange, because we're very, we actually are very separate yeah. when we go out on the street you know we go and we're like in this zone and we walk yeah. and don't talk to me and this i'm very cut off and i'm you know things cut flying at me it's like no and that seven o'clock time though was legit just bonding just yeah. bonding i'm bonding across the the street with some woman hanging out her window i've never seen before i've never seen my neighbors you know me and too yeah and suddenly every day at seven, I was like, hi, you know, and she's like, 
and it was your only interaction with people, you know? She was nice though, because my boss, Rob Diamond, he said, let's do your show live and start talking to people who might've gotten sick or, you know, so it just, it just, you can put a face with some and say, oh my God, my favorite star is going yes. through the same thing I am. Oh, or, yes. you know, or someone who runs equity is going through the same thing I am. Everybody, you could put a face to something and that would add a little calming effect to people. Like Cheyenne Jackson kicked my show off and he was like, Richie, I have to do it a little later because I got to teach my kids school. You know, I'm homeschooling and I had to put structure back in their life so they weren't missing out on stuff. That's the thing. For yeah. all of our friends who have children, yeah. I mean, I can't even, I've listened to so many of them talking about just, it's a different, so yeah. I, I can say, for me, it's like this. It's this is how I've done. But I'm living by myself in a yeah. place, you know, and I don't have children to worry about. And it's just I, my whole, just, I just have a lot of empathy for people right now um, that have a. It, it's so much worse than I do, you know, yeah. and not worse like because you have kids is worse, but you know, worse in terms of you have to think about their day and you yeah. have to give them. So I don't have to. I can be complete. I, I can care about my day. Yeah. <laughs> How am I today? <laughs> yeah, totally. What has amazed you the most and what has frustrated you the most during this pandemic? What's amazed me the most is how, um, I'll just again talk about New Yorkers. It amazed me the most how quickly New Yorkers got it. Yeah. How much we were like, got it. But it also, it didn't amaze me because we do get it. We even because we are living always on top of each other. We are also um, we're also aware that it is our responsibility to take care of one another. So, but that did that did amaze me. That's like oh we're get we're getting it quicker yeah. than a lot of places. A lot of places. Uh, this what was the second half of that question? What has frustrated you the most? I think what's frustrated me the most is people believing that it's uh, at the start, that it's a hoax yeah. that, you know, to not, it has frustrated me that there, that people come up with another option yeah. than taking care of one another. That blows my mind that it's, how is that not your first option to, how can I take care of someone today? How is that not even a thought in, in people's heads that started depressing me because also, we were glued to our screen. So there was a yeah. lot of information coming at me. And there were things that I was seeing that that were sticking, the energy sticking somewhere that just made me feel really, really hopeless. And I don't like yeah. feeling hopeless, you know. Yeah, we're the same. I mean, you're such a positive person. I'm such a positive person. You are such a positive person. You know, so it's during this, I always felt like it was like a little bit of eggshells. I'd wake up happy and I'd be like, oh, there's that little like, you know, there's still eggshells of that uncertainty because we're all a type personalities. We all work in a business where you're looking for who's my next interview? What's the next opening? What am I doing next? What's been great is living in the moment, especially for me. It's yes. just connecting. It's just, yes. it's connecting through a screen, but yes. I, can, I can sit here with you. This is my happiest hour of the day is yes. sitting here and connecting with somebody telling their story. Yes, absolutely. And that's, I think what it's come down to because I'm sure like you have been frustrated by the new normal as well, which is we can only connect via screen as opposed to yeah. when I see you on a carpet or something oh. and we can hug Kiss and then be like, hug. all right, yeah. <laughs> So what the new normal is, we connect via screen. Yeah. That started getting me, uh, that hit me recently too. That's like, oh God, this is the new normal. But then I I talk about this when I teach masterclass. And I, I always say, I'm not teaching someone how to sing. I don't know how to teach someone how to sing. But I can help you in a masterclass situation and give you some ideas of how to act a song. But I talk about in their scene work, get off yourself and get on the other. Meaning stop thinking about what does this mean to me and who am I and blah, blah. listen, just listen to the other. And that's what I realized in my own frustration about what this new normal is. You know, with my concert that I'm going to do on Sunday, this isn't about me. Yes, people are coming. They want to hear me. But they I am assuming that the other needs something and I can provide it just like you're doing this. 
And it comes from a place of you need something too. You need this connection, but you can provide this. You can facilitate this conversation with us and bring joy to the people for an hour today. Yeah. That's great. Listen, before we get into the concert, I want to ask you, you know, with so much happening in our country during this pandemic, with everyone speaking up about everything from, you know, racial injustice and Black Lives Matter, it's been wonderful. Everybody finally saying, I'm going to use my voice. And I just want you to, to tell the people who are watching how important this election is going to be in November and what it means to register and vote and how one voice can make a change. Everything that you heard him say just now, I a thousand times support that. Every single word that you just said, you articulated it perfectly. It is so, so vital that we register to vote. It is so easy. They have made it as easy yeah. as possible. Vote.org or something. Yeah. I Yes, okay. Just do it. It's, it's, it's our privilege. Yeah. It is necessary. There are people's lives on the line with this election literally their way of life is on the line so just how we started this conversation this election is about how to help the other we are not on this planet alone we are not in this country alone you are not in your state alone. we are not alone and even if you feel alone you are not alone and this voting is the way that we come together and we make real change and real change for the for the voiceless, the people who yeah. who need us to do this. So so let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Get so there. beautiful. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. Listen, well, this coming Sunday night, August 30th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you will be live. Then a one-time only rebroadcast on Monday, August 31st at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, doing your virtual concert with Seth Radetzky as part of his Seth Concert Series. How excited are you? I'm really excited. <laughs> I got my head around it that this is, this is a way to do this. We're virtual <laughs> concerting people. And this will be my first virtual concert. So I'm looking forward to that just feeling of the live and the and with Seth is always just delicious, <laughs> as we know. And I'm also I'm excited about the fact that people from all over the world yeah. can watch this concert. Everybody, no matter where you are, you get to watch this concert. And I'm really pleased about the rebroadcast at a time that makes a little <laughs> more sense for my friends in the UK. I know that. So, and also I love that my dates are August 30th and 31st because I'm just obsessed with let's end the month and let me help <laughs> you end the month on a positive note and just sing and have stories with Seth and um, I, yes. And then we'll, then we'll wake up on September 1st and we'll start <laughs> a new month, maybe with some new feelings of goodness. And I don't know, I don't know. So I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. What can the fans expect? Like what songs do you think you're going to do? What shows? I mean, what, do, what are you going to do? Well, if any fans have watched anything that Seth has done <laughs> or been to any of the concerts where we do a show with Seth, it's oh. whatever Seth figures out in that moment that he's like, let's hear this, you know, and it's like, oh, or, ah, you know, <laughs> you don't know which voice to warm up. So, um, yeah, but Let's for sure. Yeah, we're gonna hear from Phantom, <gasps> and they'll hear from the Little Mermaid. You know, you can't. I, I don't think there is a world in which I'm allowed to sing a concert without singing Phantom or Mermaid. So, I just feel actually, I feel so grateful that the songs that I'm known for or that will be attached to me for life are songs that I love singing and that are necessary in this time right now. You know, I really do. I just, I'm, I'm excited about that, that I look forward to singing the songs that the people I think are, are expecting. Yeah, know? I love it. This is your first virtual concert. Now you're in Colorado, so yeah. are, you are you at your parents' house? I'm at my parents' house, yeah. but I think <laughs> I'm actually going to a friend's house in order to do the concert because they had like a stronger, because. This is all, yeah. it's this tech stuff that we've got to make sure is right. So, and and that's actually nice. I was saying to my parents this morning, that's like, you know what's nice about me not doing the concert here? Yeah. 
you wouldn't be able to hear anything. They wouldn't if they're <laughs> here, you know, but I was looking for it because I need an audience, you know, and yeah. I was, I was going to be one of the lucky ones that has some people in my house <laughs> as an audience, but also they can't hear anything except when I'm singing a cappella, and who knows, you know, you know, it's so interesting because not only do you have to be the singer, you have to be the tech person. Oh my God, is the Wi-Fi going to go out in the middle? That's right. How is my lighting? That's Where right. am I shooting this from? It's like, it's like, you can add all these things things to your special skills now on your That's resume. It. That's like, yes, I am my own tech and it works for me because I'm very controlling. I like to be in control. So I I actually enjoy that's like, I have decided when my sound yeah. check is like, they tell me what time my sound check is that they're expecting, but I'm there a half hour early okay. with my set because I very much am, I like to be in as much control as, as I can. But it's also being in the zone. I'm like, I love 100%. People. Yeah. Like when you were doing shows, would you love to arrive to the dressing room early? Would you like to get to the I theater was there early? an hour and a half early. Mm -hmm. I'm also somebody, I need to pin curl my own hair. So for the wig prep, we pin curl, you know, and I have a lot of hair, as we <laughs> see. There's a lot of this. So I, my personal, you know, leading ladies get to have their yeah. hair pin curled for them a lot. I don't enjoy that. I enjoy doing that myself. So yeah. this, I guess, is my new pin curling my hair, setting up my ring lights and my all kinds of stuff, figuring out the setting and all those things. Have you picked an outfit? Well, I brought, so when I, when I yeah, I came, when I came from New York, I brought three dresses just in case because I still had concerts scheduled. Yeah. So there were still things that were on my schedule. I didn't know how long we were going to be in this. And then months <laughs> keep going. So I have some cute things. What I didn't realize, I got cute jewelry, but you can't wear like a chandelier earring no. with the headphone. So I'm going to have to, you know, bedazzle these or something. <laughs> I don't have time for that. But maybe as we as we find out how long this is, I'll see how much I should invest in a bedazzled headphone. Oh, just go to Amazon or someplace. Get a glue, <laughs> get a glue gun and some rhinestones. And I mean, that some, is it. Get and, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, what's it like performing with Seth? Like you talked a little bit about that. It must be so much fun because you're going to be in Colorado. He's going to be in New York. That's got to be the weirdest thing. Like, yeah, that'll be weird. I mean, but also it's like. I, I enjoy it. I'm weird yeah. in terms of a sh as a show person because yeah. I'm not a night owl. Yeah. So my concert's at eight, but it's at six here. So I'm like, great, because I like to, especially during this pandemic, yeah. I go to sleep early. And especially being in Colorado, I went away. This is, I'm yeah. sidetracking, I know. But I went away with my parents. We went away to this remote, I mean remote. Mm. No one could get to me. No, <laughs> no matter how good that Wi-Fi. No, you can't get to me. Yeah and set my alarm for 1 a.m. so that I wake up. See, as most show people would still yeah. be awake. They're just getting started at 1 a.m. But I set my alarm so that I could see stars. Aww. Stars from here to here. And that's what I, anyways. So yes, Seth will be 8 p.m. in New York. I'll be 6 p.m. in Colorado. And what I love about performing well, with Seth yeah. is the energy. You know, he is, he just, and he's, he's so quick and he remembers everything, every yeah. single little thing. and. And we're a good team. We're a good yeah. team because he'll team me up for a story and I got you and I'll get there and we'll get, and then we'll get a song. And it's, it's really fun. It's, it's just like, I think it's a joyous way to do this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a contest hooked up to your. There uh, is a contest. Concert. Yeah. Tell everybody what it is. So I think the hashtag is, yeah. I'm going to get it wrong. Do you have it there? Yeah, I have here. The hashtag is. Hashtag Seth Sing Off Sierra Edition. Now tell right. everybody what this is. Seth Sing Off Sierra Edition. And I will say, I don't know if I'm supposed to, I don't care at this moment. Yeah. We're in we're in a pandemic. Doesn't matter, all rules out the window. I have seen a lot of these videos and I don't know how. I don't know if I get to choose. I don't know who's choosing this. It's probably Seth. But I gotta say, I'm. This is why I don't like competitions because, and I always say when I teach, this business isn't a competition. So <laughs> I'm like, how do you choose? Because everybody's is extraordinary. The the competition, I, not competition. I guess the I don't know what to call it. Basically, sing part of your world and 
and post it if you feel yeah. so inclined. Use that hashtag. And then Seth, I think, will choose and then you get what what do you win you win like you win free tickets to the next three concerts so Ooh. it's really not a competition it's sort of like you could win something it's like a raffle yes. yeah it's like a <laughs> raffle it's a it's a nice raffle but yeah. i think even if i was somebody who wanted to who loved like oh, i got to sing party world i would do it and be like i just want to do it to do it so i think also during this time it's like just just sing just just put it out there if you want to. And I and I will watch them all. I really will. Because yeah. I just, it touches my heart so much, especially with the song like Part of Your World. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. here's this mermaid wanting to be on this land and this land that we're in right now is so bizarre. So it's like, this is the, the place that she wants to be in. I don't know. I just think it's, there's something magical about it. Yeah. You know, there's something, I've watched all of Seth's concerts and the interesting thing about this raffle that we're going to call it is Seth just wants you to do your version. That's like right. not Sierra's version. That's you can, right. Someone riffed something last week and he was like, it didn't belong in there, but it was fabulous. And she won. Oh, that's you know, she, the thing. she got the ticket. So yes. I'm going to tell everybody you can post a one minute cover of part of his world on Instagram with the hashtag Seth sing off Sierra edition for a chance to have your video aired during the live show with Sierra Boggess and win free tickets to the next three shows of a Seth concert series. Official rules for this are at the Seth concert series.com and videos must be submitted by tonight, August 28th at 1159 Eastern standard time. Now, again, the Seth concert series is produced by Mark Cortali and is sponsored by Broadway world and Streamyard. Tickets are available at Broadway World Events and at the SethConcertSeries.com. And they're only $25. I know where I'm going to be Sunday. Yes. And I know where I'm going to be Monday for the rebroadcast. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, I want to go back to the beginning. Growing up, I mean, I, I, I love following your family, about your parents and your sisters. But there were two women who were early inspirations for you with your life and your career. Tell me how Nancy Priest... And is it Mary Satrakian inspired you? Absolutely. Yeah. I just saw, I'll start with Miss yeah. Preet because um, I I just saw her the other day. I had, I went to her house for dinner. Oh. Nancy Priest was my, I went to George Washington High School in Denver, Colorado, which is an inner city public high school. We had no money. <laughs> and Nancy Priest was the drama teacher there. Um, and she was there for 30 years or maybe even 35 years. She retired my senior year. So I got to have all four years with her of high school and her retirement was the same year I graduated. And so once I got there, it was like, there was this legacy of Nancy Priest, legacy, 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 Nancy Priest, Nancy Priest. <laughs> and I got there and uh, I got it. I was like, uh. yeah, I got it. This was, it's the class that saved my high school oh. <laughs> career because it's I I was not a person who loved school or was good at you know learning things. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't have a brain for math at all. I glaze over. I'm really good at talking about anything, but you talk to me. You put a fraction in this conversation, and you will watch me glaze over so fast. I still can't do them. <laughs> My dad has such a math brain. He's sitting there talking to me outside the other day, just like, oh, and then, you know, and what's so great about this thing is it's 30%. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> like, <laughs> cool. Yeah. This, is, this is cool. I just can't. I It's like, it's it's another thing. Anyway, so um, Priest, so I'll stop calling her Nancy Priest now because her name was Priest. We called her Priest. And um we did four shows a year, which anybody who knows, anybody yeah. who knows about teaching or is a teacher, you know what a feat that is to, to do four shows in a year, especially at a high school with no budget, really. Yeah. Um, we put on four shows a year. And uh, what I loved and disliked at the time, but in hindsight, I'm like, oh, I got what you were doing, is because she was she taught us about theater basically being a team sport yeah and that uh if you're not if you're not starring in the show you are uh backstage doing this and this and this i mean there were times that she didn't cast me in something because it's almost too like yeah. she knew that's like this girl's gonna do this she doesn't need to be 
so priest was the kind that's like there was no this person gets cast in everything everybody you get everybody gets cast but you worked for it yeah. and if you didn't so there was times i was devastated that i wasn't cast and then here's the crew sign up sheet so you learn it's like you're doing your head of lights or your stage managing or your makeup or your sound or you're holding the spotlight or, or anything um and that's what i learned yeah and every, so I, I talk about this sometimes too, that before every single show, we would all stand in the lunch room, yeah. you know, which is our backstage. And we would, we would cross our arms over our arms like this, and we would hold on to the hands next to us. And we would go, oh, one, a two, a you know what to do. United we stand, divided we fall. Let's make this show the best of all. Give them hell. <laughs> and it was like, whoa, hugging, crying, yeah. you know, theater kids. But what I love about that is two things. One is that is like this silly chant, but it's all about unity. Let's go yeah. out there, united we stand, divided we fall, let's give them hell. And that's what that's what you loved about being in theater. It wasn't that, I I never wanted to be the star of the show. I wanted to be the character actress. I really yeah. did. I thought I, I auditioned so hard for Adelaide and Guys and Dolls. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted that part so bad but no one else could sing soprano. <laughs> so then I started be, getting cats in this, like the the ingenues. I never saw myself as that. I saw myself as quirky and yeah. fun and stuff. So I bring try and bring that to my ingenue. Anyways, but here's the other part of that yeah. um, bonding experience. Cause my sisters were both, uh, my sisters are both introverts and musicians, you know, and my older sister yeah. is a big old Broadway star musician. <laughs> She hated it because <laughs> that's a very extroverted thing to do and be like, wow, and like, because the musician, it wasn't just the actors, it was yeah. the actors and the crew and the musicians. And you know, musicians, they just want to, they just want to get in that pit. It's like, please yeah. don't make me do this. But we laugh about that still. That's like, anyway, so Priest was deeply influential. She also, um, I had no idea what Broadway was. I, I just knew that I wanted to perform somewhere. I didn't, I just yeah. loved acting. Um, and so, and I went to New York for the first time with Priest, with her, with our drama class. We took our trip to New York uh, my sophomore year of high school. And my, the first show I ever saw was Chicago. I saw Chicago wow. oh. and Anne Ranking and BB Newworth were oh. both in it. <laughs> okay. And we saw, so we saw four shows. We saw Chicago. We saw Lion King had just come out. Um, we saw Titanic the musical and we saw Rent. And oh. Rent, when I was in high school, is what Hamilton is for high school now. So it, that was really, really, that was something. But um, she has, yeah, she, she has been one of my biggest influences, I think, yeah. um, in helping me get to where I am today and uh, I think also just solidifying why I love doing what I do. And it actually yeah. has nothing to do with the, the being a, a leading lady. Yeah. It, it then, has, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And then Mary, what did Mary do for you? And so Mary, I met when I was 17 and I was wow. taking, um, I, I did a summer program up in Breckenridge, Colorado, a musical theater program. And Mary was my voice teacher there. And I had only just started taking private voice lessons. So I I always say this too, that's like, just sing. Cause I didn't take private voice lessons till I was 17 years old. And so Mary was one of the teachers there. And she was, I had just never met someone like her. She was as a teacher in terms of, um, a private teacher, she was so positive yeah. and she was so encouraging. And um, the what's connected with her is we were, I was in a master class, so I'm watching her work with somebody else. And this person was just, I, I think what I remember is they were just moving a lot while they're singing, like, I don't know. And she stopped and she was like, just sing from, sing from stillness and you know you are enough you're so enough she says it's incredible how enough you are oh. i'm a kid in the class and i always took notes and i was like that is the funniest thing i've ever heard and i wrote it down in my little yellow notebook and years later 
I'm doing Little Mermaid and I'm, I always have my notebooks with me, these masterclass notebooks. And I look in there and I see this quote and in my head it said, you are enough, you are so enough, it's unbelievable how enough you are. The original was incredible how enough you are. Wow. And I started using that to reply back to fan mail. So I would, especially during Mermaid, I was getting a lot of people writing to me that were almost talking to me as if I was a therapist. Yeah. Because there's something about Ariel that's she that they connect with on a psychological level, I think that maybe they don't even understand. And I didn't even put together until I start receiving, I mean, deep, deep things. And I, I knew that it was, I had a responsibility here. As a leading lady in a Disney show, I I can't be the one to ruin Ariel for anyone. That's a pressure, and and it's a pressure, and it's um, it's a it's a task that I'm glad that I have. But I also knew I I have a responsibility to reply in some way, but without being a therapist because I'm not qualified, and I don't want to do I don't want to ruin anything. So I just started writing back their name. You are enough. Oh. Love Sierra. Because at the end of the day, isn't that just it? You're enough. And then it became my war cry. And it sort of became this thing that's like, just from the place that we are, just who, who is to say you're not enough? How dare us say that to each other and ourselves? You know? But that's what makes everybody unique, especially in the art. So whatever they do, don't be a copy of somebody else. Enjoy your uniqueness. Do that's right. offer, you know, there's already that's a Sierra right. Vargas. Don't that's be right. Sierra. You can, you can, you, they can emulate you, but be yourself. I want to talk about your Broadway debut. We have like 20 minutes now oh, to go I'm through sorry. your- I'm sorry, I'm saying no, so no, many things. No, this is all such wonderful stuff. You know, okay, so good. many people were supposed to make their Broadway debuts this spring, then the pandemic hit. Like I was at six the night before they opened. I was dressed ready to leave the house to go to the six opening when it all happened. So it's like, I hope everybody gets to make their debuts when the theater comes back bigger and better than ever. That's debuts right. are so special. Yours was as a Disney princess, as Ariel in The Little Mermaid. What do you remember about that opening night? I was on that carpet with you. You were on that carpet. Yeah. I remember you yeah. on that carpet because I always remember your energy and I was like, I like this person. <laughs> what was that whole, what was that like for you? There's nothing like a debut. That was a big opening night. That was. There is nothing like a debut. And you know what yeah. I miss about that is you don't realize what it is when it's happening because it's your debut. And yeah. again, because I wasn't somebody, I didn't grow up watching the Tony. I didn't yeah. know what this was even until once I was in college, I started understanding what the Tonys were, anything like that. So I didn't know about this stuff. And also when I'm growing yeah. up, there isn't YouTube. So a lot of these kids now that I feel like are making Broadway debuts, they've watched people, yeah. interview. they've watched our interviews. They know that, that that's one of the things to look forward to is on opening night of my Broadway <laughs> debut, I get to have an interview here with Richie <laughs> Bridge. Like, you know, it's like, I didn't know any of that. So what I remember is um, just trying to be present and not mess up you know i was yeah. and, I, and i and i remember uh on that opening night that jody benson was in the audience and i sure didn't want to ruin the song that she made famous and i i i remember sort of invoking the energy of her with me because i like to do that instead of I, again with this it's not a competition it's like invoke the people who've come before invoke the only other people who can understand that this this is the only other person who has sung this iconic song with a lot of pressure, you know? <laughs> and so I remember that, but I remember my debut actually of my first preview was, that was even more powerful than my opening night. Yep. And so for those that haven't gotten to their opening night yet, but got to your previews, you did it, you did yep. it. You made that debut. And um, for those that, uh, for those that haven't, that were almost, that were so close and you almost got there. Don't worry, it still is possible and it will still happen. And there is no arriving. So you make your Broadway debut, it doesn't change actually anything except that it's, it's a credit, it, you did it. But the work to get there, the all the stuff that you've done to get there, 
the fact this pandemic happened didn't, doesn't take any of that away from you. It takes none of that away from you. All, you can take that away from you and, and decide that it doesn't matter. Don't, uh, don't allow yourself to do that. It's, it's okay. It's okay. It, the work that you did is worth, it's worth more than even getting to be on that yeah. stage. It really is. I will say that. And the people who are like, no, you're crazy. You'll know, yeah. you'll know what I'm saying is so when it happens. That's great. So beautifully put. You know, you have quite a history with the role of Christine and Andrew Lloyd Webber and mm -hmm. the Phantom of the Opera. I mean, you start, I mean, it, Christine kept coming back and forth for you. What does that role, those shows, Andrew Lloyd Webber, and I've got to throw director Harold Prince in there. I mean, just the greatest. Yes. What that team and all of this means to you being a part of Phantom and the role of Christine. I feel always just first thing I go to is I'm so grateful that that's how I got started because that was before my Broadway debut. I was playing Christine and Phantom yeah. in Las Vegas. I'm grateful to have met Jillian Howe. They shaped a lot of my work ethic. They became two of my like surrogate grandparents almost. They were just invaluable people in my life. We would have lunches and talk like, you know, it's not just going and doing the work at, at at, at rehearsal or something, but my work ethic was that there was, it's just, they, they, I don't know if that, if that was a dying breed of person, you know, there's, and so I, I like to try and uphold that as much as I can with, with work ethic. Um, and that role of Christine is just one I get asked all the time, like, which, which role would yeah. you want to do again and stuff? And I always, I want to do all my roles again, because as I get older, I'm like, ah, that's what it was. You know, like you think it's like, oh, that moment was that or something. It's like, oh, I could say this now or whatever. Some people are like, no, I don't want to revisit any of it. And I get that too. But for me, it's like, oh, I always want to keep working at something. Christine, it's so funny. It's like, I don't know that I'll ever be done with yeah. that. There's just, it's one of the most brilliantly written roles. And the more that I come back to it, and even when I concert with it, I've sung those songs thousands it feels like of times every time feels like the first time so i just feel really lucky and grateful to be associated with those shows yeah because i had norm lewis here and norm was like it was so great for him first to play your father in the little mermaid yeah. and then you got to be when he was the first african-american to do the role on broadway I mean, you went in the same night. We were all there. I mean, that yes. was such a, and Hal was there. I mean, Hal everybody was there. was there. I mean, in his box yes. with the family. Yes. I mean, what was yes. it like sharing the stage with Norm all over again and, and, let, and entering him into the world of Phantom? Oh, it was awesome. <clears throat> it was, what's hard for me is because I've worked on that show so many times with yeah. Julie and with Hal, when you're working with the originals and you know, they're in my DNA of yeah. Christine, each thing. So I know, and I've also heard them talk to their to the Phantom. So there were so many things I wanted to just tell Norm to like fast yeah. forward and this like, this is what it is. But there was actually times that I would, that because there's a lot of confusing stuff in there too, as you learn it. And before Jilly and Hal came in to then put their stamp and do their work with Norm and, and I, there were certain things we would come back from rehearsal and Norm's getting frustrated. And I said, just wait, Norm. I said, just yeah. wait till Jilly gets here. It'll make sense. It will make sense because all Jilly's gonna do is show you why you move your hand like this, you know, because every single thing is an iconic something or other, but it without being told why or so. So there were so many things where I was like, I know the answer, but I don't wanna say, cause I want them to say or whatever. But so that was like some technical stuff, but just on the personal level, being yeah. one of your best friends on stage, there is a trust level that we already have a second hand and we got each other. And when you're, especially doing a show like Phantom is dangerous. And we know my story, I've fallen through the door yeah. and the whole thing and lost <laughs> this tooth, this fake. And it's great. Now I'm in a pandemic and I'm on camera all the time with my fake tooth. It's great. Um, <laughs> Theatrical battle scars. <laughs> tell you what yeah that's right um but so yeah so we know that we're gonna take care of each other and that we got each other's backs first and foremost so yeah, yeah. well i just want to give a quick shout out to some of your phantoms you had two in vegas you had anthony Cravello, you had brent barrett you had you panero on broadway you had norm lewis you had ramin karam lou i mean 
Yes. I hope I'm naming most you of did. them. You did. You named them. You named them. And we, what a what a roster. Oh my gosh. If you're leading men, Those you're are leading the men. Phantoms. Yes. You know, I mean, then you got to do Terrence McNally's masterclass, which is a masterpiece. I mean, I mean, I adore Terrence McNally. You got to share the stage with uh, Tyne Daly and that. What did you take away? Because that was like one of your, your first play, even though you sang, but very dramatic. I that mean, was my first play in New yeah. York. Yes. And so I remember being yeah. terrified. One of my best friends in London, Joe Milton, <laughs> I was doing um, I was doing Love Never Dies in yeah. London on the West End. Uh, and then I got this audition through for Masterclass. And I remember there was, I won't say uh, yeah. who this was cause I don't want to throw someone yeah. under the bus, but it was pretty, it was bad. He was this, this guy was like, oh, you can't do that. He said, arias take years to learn. That's the kind of aria that takes years to learn. You'll never, it, no one ever says like, oh, you'll never be able to. It was like that stuff that you hear stories yeah. about. And it was like, what? And so for some reason that fueled me and I was like, oh, I'll, I'll learn it in a week. <laughs> so I did. And I remember I was like, I went for it. And when, so when I booked that, I was like, huh, I felt good. And, but that's who the character of Sharon yeah. is that she's like, you said, did someone say no? Great. I'll fuel that, use that as fuel and get, get this. Um, but I talked to my friend, Joe Milson, who's playing Raoul my, in Love Never Dies with me because he's an actor. Like he's yeah. like a, he does all the Shakespeare, he does every, all the plays and stuff in London. And so he helped, mm -hmm. and I called him coach, and yeah. he helped me a lot through that, just mentally, because we get these blocks that's, that, because other people put you in a box, it's the musical theater actors can't do this, which is so silly. Yeah. It, it's so silly to me because it's, because it's silly. Um, but then with Tyne, here's the thing about working with extraordinary people. It makes you want to be better and it makes you want to. So you don't have time for the, yes, you got that self-doubt and you've got all that same dialogue going on in your head, but you don't have time to sit and make a home in this negativity and self-doubt. You got to get to it. And because I got to be there for Tyne, I'm Tyne Daly's scene partner. So yeah. I better show up. And she, she is the most generous, um, hardworking, old school, not oh. old cause she not, but old school in her, in her skill and her work ethic. Again, it's that work ethic. And she also was the kind of leading lady that I want to emulate. She's the one who talked to me about there's a difference between being a star and a leading lady. And she wants yeah. to be known as a leading lady. And I, she never explained what that was, but I got it. And I was like, I see. And I've since come to expand on that. That's like a star has to make sure everything around it is dark in order for it to shine. You know, interesting. But a leading lady, you make sure everyone's coming with you. A leading man, too. It's your responsibility. Everyone, we are doing this. This is once again priest, a one, a two, a you know what yeah. to do. And Tyne Daly would come into each dressing room, no matter what. And this is with should have been you as well later when she played my mom. Yeah. She came into every single dressing room. Doesn't matter what part you're playing. She's looking you in the face, seeing your eyes before she goes and does her own prep. Oh. Wow. So yeah, yeah, I could go on. Yeah, but that, you know, it should have been you. I love that musical, Me too. Brian Hargrove, um, Barbara and I mean, yes. directed by David Hyde Pierce. What a yes. fabulous cast! Yes, I mean, you yes. were, like I said, working with time again. But you must have had such a great time doing that musical. I had the best time, and Lisa Howard was our lead oh, yeah. for that. And so Lisa Howard and I shared a dressing room. We played sisters. It was the most. Oh. It was just the best. And then next door to us was Harriet Harris, oh. with my mother-in-law. It was just the, truly the most exquisite cast. And then of course, Montego Glover and, oh. and uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, Nick, uh, Nick and, uh, and, and David, David Martha, yeah. and uh, uh, just, and Josh Grazetti, the most extraordinary group of people. We loved each other from the start. And you know, we've all heard the thing. It starts from the top. Yeah. When David Hyde Pierce is your leader. I don't know a better human than David Hyde Pierce. I really don't. Gentlemen, perfect gentlemen. <laughs> That's it. And yeah. so it really was an in incredible experience and such a such a good show. Such a good yeah. show with such a good message. School of Rock. What a fun, 
fun musical. And I mean, <laughs> and a role different than what you're used to playing the principal. Yeah. Was, was that what attracted you to that role in that show? That yeah. she was different from the ingenues you played? Well, yeah, at first when Andrew was writing, I mean, this, yeah. this had been in their mind since back when I was doing Love Never Dies, which was 2010. Yeah. I remember Andrew and Madeline talking to me about School of Rock. And so it was sort of this thing that I that I had known I was gonna do, but who knew, who knew? So many things happened. But initially I thought the role, the role was different when we first started working on, you know, as yeah. they always are. And so I didn't think of her as so different until then I then I was like, oh, she is, but I based it off of what I did was I based it off of my sister Summer because my and even my sister <laughs> Summer wears these glasses. Yeah. So I wore those glasses. I asked the costume to that I want this shape, please, for my glass. I wanted exact because I love my sister Summer is my best friend, been my role model since I was born on this planet. One of the best humans that anyone can yeah. ever know. And so I love her and we're very different people, but I interviewed my sister as if it was research of like, because my sister is much more black and white than I am. And Rosalie Mullins is black and white. Yeah. She is the principal, she has a job to do. And she's she is a job's worth too. There's no, let me see if I can look at that a different way. It's the answer is no. But my sister, I remember her <laughs> telling me, she's like, it's not because you don't love the kid, it's because you love them that you're like, no, that will get you in trouble. Like a Dewey Finn coming in. Yeah. That's like, no, this will kill you if you listen yeah. to him. That's how serious that type, because this person coming in, the, it's so, so, but here's the other thing is that the heart of every Rosalie Mullins is a Dewey Finn. Yeah. You know, so it's not so different than it's just playing humans. Yeah, but you got to play with that powerhouse of Alex Brightman. I mean, wow. Now that was cool. Also, yeah. I think more than me playing Miss Mullins, my favorite things about School of Rock were watching Alex Brightman, who was unknown, completely yeah. unknown. No one had ever heard of Alex Brightman. Watching him rise to yeah. who, who he is and stepping into the role of being a leading man. Yeah. Um, that was really awesome to be there for and be a support. Um, that I loved, but I also loved the kids. Oh, so talented. I tell all you, I'm like, all of, and I was just saying the other day, I just had a little School of Rock reunion with the women of School of Rock. Yeah. We had a little Zoom reunion. We were saying that's like, do you know the reason to have an Instagram account is to is so that when you've worked with kids, you get to watch them grow up. Yeah. I'm watching these kids and yeah. I've written like for uh, the ones that now have gone on to college, I wrote uh, a letter of recommendation for one. Like, and when I got the oh. thing through, I was like, I've known these kids since they were 12 <laughs> and 13 yeah. years old and now I'm writing them a college thing or like, oh, it's unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Now, speaking of School of Rock and the Winter Garden Theater, there is a lady, a woman behind me. Yep, oh, yep. She's right. coming up there. There she there is. There she is. Did you, did you have Barbara Streisand's dressing room? I had Barbara Streisand's dressing room. Uh, I had Barbara I Streisand's dressing room. Yes, okay, I did. So, so I'm sure the first second you got that and walked through the door, I mean, I know you adore her more than anything in the world. That's right. What, what, what is the connection between why her? Like, what was it? What connects you to Barbara so much? Yeah, I remember falling in love with her. The first thing I ever saw her do was Hello, Dolly. I had it on VHS. Yeah. And I, I was obsessed with the way her mouth moved when she sang, yeah. I've always been a woman who arranges things. And I was like, what is that? I was obsessed with it. And I was probably nine years old or something. <laughs> now, what I think in, so that was the start of it. And then I couldn't get enough. I had Barbara everything, just all the movie, everything, <laughs> CDs and my all my mom's records. My mom had all these records. Oh. The Christmas album, the Barbara Streisand Christmas album is one of the yeah. staples. It's like Christmas doesn't happen until I watch Jim Carrey and the Grinch. And I listened to Barbara Streisand's Christmas album. So I had all my mom's albums I would listen to. We would listen. And then when you could figure out how to put them on cassette tapes, that yeah. became a thing. That was a project of mine. So I could listen to them in the car, you know. 
on uh, the Walkman. I had a Walkman. The Walkman, you know it. <laughs> and that Discman came. Why Discman? It, what was the point? Might as well have a Walkman because it won't skip. Thank you. Uh, you know. <laughs> anyway, so, but you know what I think when I reflect now, I think what I was responding to is that Barbara Streisand was Barbara Streisand. Yeah. She, there is no one, not one single person that is like her. Yeah. And I think that's, again, that's the why I connect with this you are enough quote. And it goes back to for everybody who wants to put themselves on tape for this Seth contest that we're having. Yeah. Be your version, your version. Barbara Streisand was no one else's version. She was her version. And the strength um, uh, of who she is and realizing that's like being a woman in the time that she was yeah. and being the first woman director to win a thing and just all kinds of stuff. These are things I didn't realize until I got older that's like, oh, you know what I was also connecting to on a deep level is that. I love it. I, I love that you got to have her dressing room at the Winter Garden Theater where she did Funny Girl. And you, I saw pictures of your dressing room with the candles and everything. And I'm like, everything. Everything. But that's the thing. I didn't set that Barbara Streisand yeah. dressing room up because it's that. That's how every dressing room is. Yeah. There are always framed Barbara Streisand pictures in my room. And so the day that she came to my dressing room when I wasn't there, oh. but she walked in and I bet she thought it was a setup. Yeah. That it's like someone set this up. But no, that was just Sierra's dressing room. That's how she, you know, I put that inspiration on the wall. That's fabulous. That's great. Well, we are almost out of time, but I have oh. a few more things I want to okay. ask you. I told you before we started, I'm obsessed with your website. Anybody out there, just sarahbogus.com. It's so beautifully laid out. But the second you get there, you are just writing, you are enough. I mean, yeah. it's it's so calming and positive and inspirational. What did you want to achieve with your website? But I, I also want to ask you about Light Lessons, I, what we opened the show with. Yes. These beautiful little videos you make with people. Talk about Light, light Lessons. Okay, so first I'll just shout out Tony Howell who created yeah. my website with me. And it's through that vision yeah. that he, he really listened to what I wanted and he is extraordinary. I can't, I love Tony so much. Yeah. He is an excellent he's brilliant um and so he really helped my vision come true um and i didn't want it to be like here's my resume you know <laughs> even though that's important like it's got to be in there but it's sort of like you got to find it but i i want it to be a you are enough and then there's a place in my uh on my website that says light lessons i think under yep. my name first it's you are enough and you can yep explore what I mean with the you are enough thing. Cause I think I've been associated with that now as much as I am with Little Mermaid yeah. or Phantom. And so then with light lessons, these are little cards that I made um, a few years ago, actually uh, two, two or two years ago, maybe. Um, and they're cards that I developed with my friend, Jane Jordan, who runs fit for Broadway. And we, and basically I just wanted to have something where you can pull a word and focus on it. Yeah. And these are 20 different words or phrases that listen or surrender or be brave um, or light worker or openness or empathy or integrity, positive things that you can focus on. So once the pandemic hit, I wasn't selling them anymore because right. I didn't feel right about selling product right now. Nobody has a job or any money. So we, we took that out for now and we'll see what happens. But I thought, what can I do to bring this online to the people and do it for free? Right. And I saw, and I saw that there, it felt to me like there was a need for it. There was a need for just simplicity. And so I, um, I just, it was one day I was just like, great, I'm going to start filming these things. And I did. And I just started and there's going to be 20 episodes and oh. we're over halfway through. Yeah. Well, we've everybody, had amazing yeah. people on there. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Just for a calming afternoon or whatever, or an evening or a morning, just go to sierravagas.com and have a beautiful, beautiful time. Oh. That's, that's all I'm going to say. That's awesome. Um, my final question for you is what have you learned the most about yourself during this pandemic? Hmm. I think I've learned that, uh, that I don't like to stay down for too long. Yeah. I really have, I, I've solidified that in myself that I'm, the work that I've been doing, therapy, you know, yeah. 
yoga, all the stuff that I have been doing for years, the work, it has been really, it's good. And now is the time that if you have those tools, you better start using them, you know, and not just have like a bunch of cool quotes everywhere, but really use them um, so that you don't set up shop or your new home down in the depths because, and it's okay to go down. I want to make sure that people hear yeah. me say that it is okay to go down and, and also hear me say, I go down, but I'm more interested in getting myself back up. But when I go down, I'm, I go to, what am I supposed to learn? What am I, what's, what's down here to know, but then how can I help? Because as we've seen, going back to your question, what's amazed you the most about this time Two, what's amazed me is this isn't just a pandemic. You know, this isn't just we got there's a COVID. It's also wh what do you stand for? Who are you standing for? So yeah. we can't stay down in our woe is me too long because we got to help. We got to get out there to help in whatever way you're called to. Yeah. That's so beautiful. Well, I want to tell our audience once again, Sarah will be live this Sunday night, August 30th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and a one time only broadcast on Monday, August 31st at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Seth Rudetsky as part of the Seth Concert Series. It's produced once again by Mark Cortali, is sponsored by Broadway World and StreamYard. Tickets are available at Broadway World Events and at thesethconcertseries.com. And again, they are only $25. Sarah, I've had a blast catching me up too. with you. Oh, me too. I Thank have been, you. I've covered all your milestones, all your opening <laughs> nights since you got here in New York. And yes. I just, but I love that you have always stayed so positive through oh, everything. You too. You we too. Do, <laughs> we do what we do. Listen, everybody, stay safe until the theater is back, bigger and better than ever. We'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.